Hi everyone. Hold on, Nadia's connecting. There you are. Hi. Hi. I'm, not sure why I'm sideways. You're sideways. <laughs> let's, fix, let's fix that. <laughs> Wait, now oh, you're upside down. Now I'm upside down. Okay. <laughs> this is like a, you know the clown car. It reminds me of the clown car when they get out of the car. So oh, there you are. Okay. Yay. <clears throat> Let me ask Hi, everyone. Us. Hi, Karen. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Hello, hello. Yeah. Welcome to another edition of Cook and Book. Yes. <laughs> yes. Awesome. All right. Oh, I see a couple more joining. Maybe we should hang out a little bit. Yes. Maybe yes. Yeah. So this is, oh, let me turn my volume up a little. There we go. So this is Cook and Book. And Nadia and I have done a few cooking books in the past. They always have some kind of theme going on, you know, like Easter theme or, um, you know, Christmas theme, holiday, um, holiday edition. Today is the harvest edition. So yes. a little bit about that. Why are we doing harvest edition? edition nadia please okay because well in canada here many people are celebrating thanksgiving we celebrated in october which is a little bit earlier than our friends south of the border um we celebrate in november um and also even if you don't celebrate uh, thanksgiving or acknowledge uh, thanksgiving it's also a time of harvest when a lot of food is being um collected and and, and and it's really yummy the time of year. But also, it just so happens that both Shadi and I have new books. And these books have to do with food. So here we are again talking about our books and even have some cooks, some recipes, and some food we're going to be sharing with you. Uh, this is Shadi's newest book, Julie and the Mango Tree. Um, Shadi, could you tell us a little bit about your new book? <clears throat> yeah, so this is my second picture book. Uh, Julie and the Mango Tree came out in August and um, it's about a little girl named Julie who just wants a mango so she because who doesn't love mangoes right everyone loves mangoes so she just wants a mango and she tries all these different ways to get one and um, it's a cute little story it's uh, illustrated by Sayada Ramdial who did a really fantastic job with these illustrations like I can't even get over them they're just so beautiful and vibrant and like just so cute um and um she's a trinidadian um illustrator and she did such a great job so this is julian mango tree and if you haven't read it already you should pick it up and give it a read because it's so cute and it will remind you of back home if you are from the caribbean islands so yeah yes, very yeah nostalgic. i love this book so much and I, I love the, the, you're right, the illustrations, illustrations are so bright and colorful and delectable. And I just felt like I was surrounded by fruit. And shortly before the book came out, I actually went to Jamaica and I spent some time in my um, grand uncle's backyard and the mangoes were new. So there was a lot of nostalgia and love for this book. Um, it's so adorable. I can see uh, Cabrina says, Ava Michelle just saw me walking and shouted out, that's my favorite book. Oh, it's thank you, book. thank you. It's such a gorgeous <laughs> book. So I, I think we'll take, maybe we take some time to talk a little bit about this book and then we'll jump into the next book. But um, uh, Shade, do you mind just reading, a, uh, choosing a section that you like when you read this from this book? Sure, I can definitely do that. Huh. Oh, for, hold on. For those of you just joining us, we didn't even introduce ourselves. Oh. <laughs> so, okay, let's take a step back. Okay, my name is Nadia Han. I'm uh, an author. I'm also an educator, a teacher. That's what I do in my day job or part of my day job. I'm also an archivist and I, uh, I'm the author of several books for young people. Uh, my newest book is called The Anti-Racist Kitchen, 21 Stories and Recipes. And I was the editor of this book. It's a middle grade cookbook anthology. And I'm really excited to share it with you today. Yes. I know. I, I, I always forget to introduce myself all the time. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> but hi, I'm Shade Smith. And I am a children's book author of uh, Julie the Mango Tree. 
and Granny's Kitchen. And um, yeah, I'm also a design technologist. So I, and I do interior design and architectural technology. And I also do skilled, uh, skilled trades like carpentry, electrical. So that's what I do when I'm not being a writer. Well, I'm always a writer, but when I'm not writing. <laughs> uh, so I, um, yeah, that's just pretty much it about me. Awesome. And we we're just saying that we just like to do these cook and books around different themes. Um, this time we're doing the harvest edition because of the time of year it is in Canada. And also because both Shade and I have new books that are out. So um, we're going to be talking about the food. Uh, we have recipes in both of our books. Um, my recipe just, I just heard the timer go off. So it sounds like it's ready. So I'm going to pull it out of the oven. But while I do that, I've asked Shade to read one of her favorite excerpts from her newest book, Julie and the Mango Tree, which you need to pick up, by the way, if you haven't done so already. <laughs> For sure. All right. So this is Julie. I'm going to read uh, just a small little bit about of Julie and the Mango Tree from Julie and the Mango Tree, <clears throat> illustrated by Sayara Rambiel. And I'll read the first page because it's just so beautifully illustrated. That looks so much like Jamaica. So Julie lived on a tiny island called Jamaica, which has so many fruit trees, it would be impossible to count them all. Julie loved all kinds of fruit, but the ones she loved most were mangoes. The way they looked so colorful, the way they smelled so sweet, and especially the way they tasted so juicy. So that is the first page of Julie and the mango tree. Here, I'll read one more page until Nadia gets back. Uh, in the front yard of Julie's house stood a giant mango tree, but the mangoes were too high up for Julie to reach, even if she stretched up onto her tippy toes. She had to wait for them to drop to the ground before she could eat them. And there's Julie trying to get her mango, but she just can't because she's too small. And there she is with her precious mango tree. So that is a few pages of Julie the Mango Tree. And if you want to know if Julie actually gets that mango, uh, you can go ahead and get the book and read through it and you will find out. And it's such a gorgeous book. So I, I mean, I have a lot of questions and I so want to jump in. Um, so we could do two ways. I would, uh, so I could ask you questions now, Shade, or if you want, I could be my expert. What do you think? Um. Yeah, well, yeah, you know what? Let's throw some questions in there. Why not? Okay. This is a great time for you to jump in with some questions, too. So my first question is, what inspired you to write this book, Shade? Uh, Julian Mango Tree was inspired by my grandmother. So I was at her house, and she had, like, a whole bunch of mangoes, like, a huge bag of mangoes. And I'm like, what are you going to do with all these mangoes? It's too much. I'm like, that's so many mangoes. And then... <laughs> Um, I, it just like inspired a story idea. I'm like, hmm, so many mangoes, which was the original title of this book. It was originally called So Many Mangoes, but then we changed it to Julie and the Mango Tree because it was a little bit more clever, named after the Julie Mango. So the character's name is Julie, named after the Julie Mango, and we changed the name. But it was originally called So Many Mangoes, but that, it was only because of I said, oh my gosh, it's so many mangoes. Mm -hmm at my grandma's house and that's where the story idea came from and it's so clever because the, the name is so catchy right away when i saw julie i thought of mango like julie and mangoes and then there, of course uh there's a type of mango called the julie mango and they're very sweet they're very delicious there's also i believe a comedian named julie mango as well that's so right. uh she's very funny as well so i just thought wow this is so clever and the like i said the illustrations are just adorable engaging and i just noticed that the dad has dreadlocks and yes. i just love it like you know <laughs> he's a yeah. hip dad he's got his dreads you know and um julie is like she really wants a mango she's stressing out over it she's really determined and i was really inspired by her determination but not only her determination it's something we call cunning cunning mm. is cleverness and i know uh, we have a jamaican folk song i also have a jamaican background like sade and the song is called dr but a cunning but hard but dead and cunning 
it's like she's cunning yes she is not gonna give up she's gonna get that mango no matter what and she right. spends her time pondering <laughs> trying to figure out this issue this this dilemma she's trying to get an angle so what inspired you like why was she so driven what inspired you with that like julie's not a child that gives up so where did that um come from? you know what i kind of based the character on myself <laughs> a little bit because mm -hmm. <laughs> whenever i want something i just go out and i get it and i try so many different ways to do it yeah um, however i need to do it i'll do it to get to what i want so i kind of based the character a little bit on my own you know my own self yeah and i i saw a little bit about that um because i know you in your day job your your other your other hat you wear you're an architectural technologist just an architectural technologist <laughs> you're an interior designer and there's a lot of problem solving in those careers like you have to look at a, a situation and be strategic and you have to figure it out yeah. and i can just imagine that um came in handy when you were thinking of julie yes it sure did, it sure yeah. did. yeah yeah and i just was i i think you also told me at one point i i can't remember if it was your sister or somebody looked at the julie illustration and said that looks like me yes <laughs> like yeah my Could sister you tell us about that it looks the character like the julie character on the cover looks like my sister when she was small which is so weird because like sayada doesn't even know what my sister looks like uh, so my sister saw it and she's like oh that looks like me and i was like i know it does that's so weird yeah, <laughs> so Sayada, I believe Sayada lives in um, Trinidad, right? She no, she lives in Oregon. Or Oregon, she lives in the USA so, right now. Yeah, yeah, but she's from Trinidad. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> but I just love it, and this book is just so satisfying. I could just uh, I teach a lot of young kids. I teach kindergarten to grade two, so I could just picture the kids adoring this, and and also knowing that feeling because at some point she gets what she asked for right yes. so what is that what was that like i can't i don't want to give it all away but how much can you tell us um well she eventually does get the mango how many is the, the question question <laughs> right so many mangoes right so many I, mangoes yeah she's such a clever little girl now um i think uh you brought some treats did you want to maybe we'll share the treats at the end um well what? what are you what are you making what are you cooking okay well We're i'm doing making, a lot of cooking but where's the cooking uh, okay well my cooking is uh, cooling right now so maybe this will be a good uh chance to segue into a little bit about the book that i edited sure. and it's sure well, can the, you tell us what you're making though sure it's called apple guava cake mm -hmm. And it's a it's a recipe that was submitted by Ruth Bihar, who's also an author. And funny enough, she has a book um, about a puppy, a picture book that just came out about a puppy named Pepita. Mm -hmm. And Pepita means um, pumpkin seeds in Spanish. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a, a, a recipe that she shared. Um, and we'll read a little excerpt from her story because this book is a collection mm -hmm. of stories. And uh, this was a recipe she provided. Uh, and uh, Ruth Bahar is actually um, a Cuban uh, background, also Jewish. So she shared the story behind the origins of this dish. So this and recipe is in the book of yes. Anti-Racist Kitchen. Exactly. Okay. In the Anti-Racist Kitchen. All right. Let's see. So, okay. Yeah. So I, um, I'm going to start off with, I think, a part of the book. Uh, so just a part of the introduction. And then I'll jump into uh, Ruth's story for a little bit. So this book is called The Anti-Racist Kitchen, and I will read you the first part. It's the introduction that I wrote. What if talking about racism, racism was as easy as baking a cake? And interestingly, we're having a cake today. So what if talking about racism was as easy as baking a cake, frying plantains, or cooking rice? Just picture it. You add a cup of each of understanding and active listening, a tablespoon of tolerance, sprinkle in community, while freely adding in allyship, empathy, apologies, and restoration. Everyone gets a turn to stir the pot, let it simmer, and when it's ready, you have anti-racism. And everyone gets a helping. Sound easy, right? So I, I wish uh, solving racism were really that easy, 
but I'd like to believe that this book would help make it a little bit easier. And I'm going to just share um, from Ruth's story and uh, that is called Between Gu Guavas and Apples by Ruth Behar. And this recipe is called Mummy's Apple and Guava Cake. So I'm going to jump ahead. <laughs> I guess I should have um, marked these out, but that's OK. There's a, a table of contents at the front. So <laughs> All righty. Between Guavas and Apples by Ruth Behar. Growing up in New York in a Cuban immigrant family, I learned that you can make a simple and delicious dessert just by combining a slice of thick guava paste or pasta de guayaba with a chunk of cream cheese and eating it on a crispy round cracker called a galleta cubana. Now, I've had something like that and it's amazing. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was too young when I arrived from Cuba to remember what a guava fruit looked or tasted like. It wasn't until I returned to visit Cuba as an adult that I ate the actual fruit and discovered how messy and full of seeds it is. With a smell so sweet, it's hard to describe. Once the fruit is mixed with sugar and boiled down to make a gooey rectangular slab, it becomes a unique concoction that can travel for miles and keep for months. The perfect food for immigrants, travelers, and those who live on islands like Cuba and don't have refrigerators. Mommy always made sure to pick up some pasta de guayaba and gua guava jam too whenever we went to the Latino bodegas on Roosevelt Avenue. Guava was comfort food for us, a reminder that we came from an island in the Caribbean where the evening breezes felt soft against our skin and a rainy day could turn to a sunset, surprising us with a double rainbow. I loved guava paste and assumed everyone else enjoyed it as much as we did. But as an immigrant child, still learning English and trying to fit into American culture, I soon learned that eating a cracker with guava and cream cheese didn't count as a dessert for most people who considered themselves Americans. Hmm. I'm going to stop right there, but I will show you the illustration. And these illustrations are by Rosa Nozari. Very and there's nice. also a photo of the dessert <clears throat> at the very end, a little bio about Ruth Behar. And then there's a photo of the dessert with the recipe as well. And that is what I made today. Nice. So just cooling down a little bit. I'll show you all about it. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yes, this book was actually, I love this book. Um, I know it's filled up with like so many delicious recipes. And I love the stories that go with them. I'm just like, this is such a very interesting idea. Mm -hmm. um, like for the book in general, how did you come up with this concept? Like, what made you think of, of, you know, having stories about racism with the foods together? Like, how did you come up with this concept? Thank you for the question. So, so thank you for the question. So the, the thing with this book, uh, there was a lot happening at the time when I started pitching the book, but I had the idea. I've, I've always wanted to make a cookbook. I've, I just always wondered, am I a good enough chef? Do I know enough recipes? Like that kind of thing. But I always love to cook. Um, and then I'd say like 2019, this is before the pandemic started. I started uh, thinking of like an idea for a collection of uh, a book with uh, like diverse authors with a little bit of like a background profile. And I know I've seen things like that um, that are uh, older books, Canadian books, but I hadn't seen anything like that recently to celebrate our all the diversity of the, the wonderful authors that are being published now. Um, and I also uh, had been going to the United States quite a lot for different conferences, courses, retreats. So I was getting to know um, diverse authors, Black, Indigenous, people of color, BIPOC authors in both Canada and the United States. So I started thinking of ways to bring all of those voices together. And I really have to say it was after uh, the racial justice movement in June 2020. Um, we were in the pandemic, George Floyd, um, this, like, what happened with George Floyd, and then all the things that came out as a result of that. Mm -hmm. And that's when I think the ideas started to gel a little bit, where I saw, I think this needs to be a book 
that deals with racism, but also the food aspect, it gives it a context and gives us a chance to heal because there were a lot of things happening. A lot of communities were affected and it was very difficult season for many, many people. So that's where the food came and the food is supposed to be a healing, but also a, a vehicle to, um, to share about the, 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 the discrimination and also about the, the history of some of the hard things we've been through. So the food serves a lot of purposes and it also brings people together. I agree. I agree. Because, you know, food, that's, that's really what food is. Like, it doesn't even, food always brings people together. Like, that's, mm -hmm. like, even being, like, in architecture, like, the kitchen is the most important part of the project, mm. like, all the time. So the kitchen is the gathering space. That's where everybody gets together. Mm -hmm. That's where everybody hangs out. That's where all the, like, you know, the action is. So mm -hmm. the kitchen is always very important. So whenever we're designing, the kitchen has to be like the best part of the entire, you know, place of the entire structure. Like that's, we focus mainly on the kitchen. So I think the kitchen, anti-racist kitchen was a perfect title. Um, Cause that shows gathering, right? Mm -hmm. That shows like togetherness, you know what I mean? Unity. So yeah. Yeah. I thought the title was very, very clever as Thank well. You. Thank you so much. As the book. This wasn't the this wasn't the original title. I actually wanted to call it the anti racist cookbook, but mm -hmm. that title was already taken. <laughs> and then, of course, what you do as a writer, like you go back and forth with your publisher, and you have different ideas. So um, I I gave a few ideas, but they actually came forward with the anti racist kitchen. I actually um, really grew to to like it, and um, I'm so glad that's the title of this book. And like speaking it. of kitchens, I noticed you have a kitchen behind you. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I I do I I love I'd love to how you change the, the the title. Um I had another question. So what did what do you expect to um like gain from this book? Like what's the, what what's the what's the outcome that you're expecting from, from um, the what, book? That's a great question. And uh, the outcome I'm hoping is for courageous conversations to happen. I want uh, the kids that are, are BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color who experience racism and discrimination, prejudice, um, I want them to see themselves in the stories. I want them to feel represented. I want them to feel proud of the diversity. Um, I hope, I know uh, I did my best to make sure there was a lot of representation from different experiences. And I hope that there would be kids that felt that they could identify with some of the themes. So that was probably the, the biggest thing I hoped for. I also hope that educators, teachers like myself um, would see this as a, a way to engage students in their classroom and do anti-racist work and feel like they had a stepping stone to do that. And something that's age appropriate, child friendly, that builds community and helps for us to, to take down some of our walls because sometimes when we talk about racism, people's walls go up, their defensiveness goes up, people feel unsafe, people feel unheard, they feel that they're gaslit or um, they are sometimes uh, discouraged or told, you know, that they didn't experience that. There's all kinds of things that happen. So I want people to feel heard and seen and I want, I want people to come in and around the table and listen. That's really what I want to happen. Nice. Listening and for others to share their stories and feel brave in doing so. So that's, if that all happens around this book, I will be like, you know, and it's, I, I believe it's already starting to happen. I, I visited a school yesterday and they've been, they've been teaching the, the, the stories and starting to do that work in their school. And I really am excited to see what comes out of this process very nice very nice yes i do like how there's so many different kinds of people from so many different walks of life that are in this story like i'm seeing like nigerian there's korean there's indigenous there's like so many different um ethnicities which i think is really amazing sorry that's ziggy <laughs> that's i i love your little doggy it's so cute and the cool thing about it is i mean those all the groups that shade mentioned um have 
historically had experiences of racism, and we also experience racism differently. Um, we have in, there's intersectionality, there's racism that's impacted by class and by social economic status and by gender and all those things. So there's so many levels, and and I had I did my mass my first master's in equity studies. So this is. I'm very comfortable with having these conversations and I want everybody to feel just as comfortable in having this. And my, my discovery during the pandemic, sadly, a lot of people aren't that comfortable. Mm -hmm. They don't want to have that conversation, but I want to make it so easy to have yes. that conversation. Exactly. That's just like as easy as baking a cake, right? So it's like, it's you know, you can still it. talk about it and still discuss it and, you know, feel comfortable talking about it, right? Like, I think that's, that's a really great idea because it's it's it happens it's happening and you know what i mean so the more you talk about it um you know the more comfortable you'll become with you know things that are going on and, and also too i feel like the more you you hear about it the more you can do about it exactly because right? sometimes people do don't it. even yeah. really realize things that happen to you know people unless it happens to them right That's so right. you wouldn't know exactly that racism even exists unless, you know, it's it's against you, right? Exactly. And then you're like, oh yeah, I, I don't feel so great. But if it doesn't happen to you, you would not, probably wouldn't even notice, exactly. right? Exactly. So, exactly. I think that's a really great, um, great concept. Do you have any, um, any other books like this that you have, like maybe in the works perhaps? Well, maybe a different I type have, of theme? Yeah, I have another novel that I've been working on it started as a play I wrote when I was in high school mm -hmm. and it eventually became my uh my master's thesis ah. so it's a novel a young adult novel I've been working on it for I'd say ooh, <laughs> many years and my hope is that uh, it's I call it an anti-racist novel and it's a, a, a young adult novel so I am Currently, uh, I got it back from my agent about a year ago. I'm Thanks. finally getting back to it and going through the revisions. I've had a number of cultural and sensitivity readers read it because I want it to feel authentic. And I also want to make sure that I'm being respectful to the groups that are represented. Right. And I can't wait for it to be published one day. So I am on that right yes. now. That's probably the closest thing right now that's to this. Um, I do have a book coming out next year. Uh, and it's called journey to grandma's house okay yeah so i that's all i can say about it nice <laughs> it's, okay um, but you'll find out some more soon um and the illustrator is wonderful i got a chance to meet her um and she is based in uh the u.s so nice. um yeah so we met virtually and then we had an, a, a time got a chance to meet each other over the summer um and yeah just, i just i'm gonna continue writing stories that deal with um, social issues. As I mentioned, I'm an archivist. I like to look at creative ways to, to address social issues and social justice issues in my stories. And what about you? What about you, Shade? Do you have any? Um, I have, oops, let's push my whole thing away. I have a few, um, few books uh, in the works. Uh, hopefully I can talk about them soon. Can't say anything yet what they're about, but there are a few that um, should be coming shortly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. There's a thing with being a writer, right? I like, know. We have these stories and these ideas, and we got to keep them hush hush a little bit. Sometimes some writers don't like to talk about them because they feel like it's like kind of jinxing uh -huh. it. And then sometimes, uh -huh. just, you know, you, you're still dealing with it and kind of flushing it out. So it's a fair, fair, fair game. Right? Yeah. Um, uh, I know we always have to keep these secrets until a certain time and then we can like exactly. tell the world but yeah yeah <laughs> but oh I forgot I'm actually making something I was supposed to make mango juice I could not find any ripe mangoes so I had to uh make I had to change it up and I'm making mango slaw which oh. is actually oh. located in the back of uh Julian the mango tree so mango salad. So it's there are recipes in the back of this book, just Yum. like Ryan's kitchen. Mm -hmm. So I am making a mango salad, which is this one on the bottom here. Mm -hmm. So I'm just gonna quickly show you guys how to make the mango salad. Sure. <laughs> so, and I was 
wondering also as you get that ready um, are there any questions from the audience if you have questions just pop yes, them please, in the chat please feel, throw them in there yeah i do see lots of folks joining us but feel free to pop in your questions in the chat for sure all right so to make mango salad you just need some chopped up mangoes which i have right here uh, you need some cilantro so it says two cups of mangoes half a cup of cilantro uh, some a red onion. I have just regular onion, so I'm gonna have to use that. <laughs> I forgot the right onion. Um, half a lime. So I have mm. half a lime juice here. Some pepper and black pepper. Some salt mm. and jerk sauce. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I'm gonna put a little bit of that in there. I have so, to do this. I have to do my my African snap. <laughs> this is uh that's. That's what sure. it is, right? Yep. That's right. So you just peel and pit the mangoes, chop them into small chunks, just like this. Place them into a large bowl, which I have done. Here's my bowl of mangoes. And then finally chop cilantro. Add to bowl with chopped mangoes. So I'm gonna put the cilantro in there. Cilantro. Diced red onion, add to bowl onions add to bowl onions and toss ingredients together in bowl until combined until evenly combined add jerk sauce mm -hmm. jerk sauce mm -hmm. so you just need one tablespoon of jerk sauce i am a bit of a wimp so pepper is not really really my favorite thing i don't really do i know i'm such a um, yeah wow I'm like oh, okay. that. I, that's I don't okay. really do you pepper. know what no I, judgment here no honestly judgment. you like what you, you like you know what <laughs> family functions i get right i got like they write on me all the time oh kind of jamaican you are you don't have don't eat pepper so yeah i get i get made fun of all the time by family <laughs> members i'm used to it <laughs> but <laughs> i put a little bit of jerk sauce in there and uh squeeze the lime which i've already squeezed just for convenience and you just pour it on top and then you mix it all together i'll oh and salt and pepper now the salt and pepper mix it all together and you got mango salad and you can enjoy so yum yeah that's yes. amazing then, if i can open up the salt <laughs> here we go so a little asmr for the uh for the live here you know what it's really cool to see you actually prepare it because normally um, when we've done dishes together uh we've had it pre pre-done or pre-cooked sometimes a little hard to cook on camera but i appreciate the effort shade it's yeah see these are quick and easy recipes they take like less than five minutes and they're also recipes um that little small children can make themselves as well so i wanted to put very easy recipes so that kids can just you know it's a kid's book right so they're supposed to be able to enjoy the recipes that are in you know the book so that's why i made the recipes super simple and they're quick and easy and you mm -hmm. have mango salad the jerk sauce gives a little bit of a zing i like to kind of leave it to sit down in the um the lime juice for a bit so that it kind of softens up the mango just a tiny bit and um yeah there you have it and you can this tastes really good with um as like a side so you can have it with mm -hmm. like something mm -hmm. spicy because it has yeah. that like sweet, uh, that sweet you know yeah. the sweet uh, to spicy ratio sweet, you know, i so, love the sweet and spicy right? it's, a, it's one of my favorite combos exactly yeah. this would be mango oh, was, salad yeah. so there you go it could probably taste really good with like on a side yeah. uh on the side of something even maybe even if you like to make a, a burger um to put it in the burger a little bit exactly toss it on a, a green some salad greens we have a question from cabrina cabrina i hope i'm saying your name correctly and she asks how important is it for us to incorporate elements incorporate elements of our culture in and heritage into the stories we write that, that is a really good very question good question i think Thank it's you. very very important um i feel that like that's why i write um i write you know books of representation so that little black children can see themselves in books i think it's very important um i also feel like that's what like i also you know incorporate jamaica into my books right um 
because I want little Jamaican kids to see themselves in books as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, I just feel like it's so important. Like it, I, whenever I see like black characters, I feel like it feel. I mean, it makes me feel really good because I'm like, oh my gosh, that's me. Like you know, what I mean, that's. And then I have a lot of kids tell me they see the book, the book covers, and they're like, that's me. And yeah. I'm like, you know what? Yeah. That is you. Like yeah. that is exactly why I wrote this book so that you can see that that is you right so yeah i feel like it's very very important for sure. yeah and i i can attest for the fact that i actually went visited a school to present and the librarian told me uh she was reading your book and one of the students said the same thing you know that's me in there and you know certainly growing up in canada i i grew up in the 80s and 90s I didn't see books uh, that look like me That's in the right. library with kids, Canadian kids, um, Jamaican kids. Uh, I, and there were there are a few uh, authors I really enjoyed reading, and um, and I'm thankful for uh, for the African American writers because I read a lot of books, uh, but there weren't that many books to begin with. Right. So there's something to say about just seeing yourself represented. I know as a teacher when I read books where kids actually recognize the culture, the topics, or see characters like themselves. The kids are engaged, <clears throat> yes. the kids brighten up, something inside them light, up, like just brightens up. You could tell they are standing, sitting taller and they see that familiarity and it helps their classmates understand them better. So I, I would hope that my books get to do that for kids and I will continue to write. I know um, I once I had been asked a long time ago, do I, you know, about feeling pigeonholed or something because I write uh, books that are reflect my background, but not at all. No. I'm writing the books that I wish I had as a kid. That's I'm writing great. the books for the students that I teach. I'm writing books for things that I don't see books on, right? So I'm That's creating. Right. A, um, it, it's a lot of, and I always try to get better as a writer <laughs> that can convey the information in a in way that makes kids feel seen and heard and, and do it in a, in a in a way so it's essential it's a huge part of my background and why i write as well i agree it's true mm -hmm. the kids do get very excited because whenever i read granny's kitchen at school visits all the jamaican kids are like when as soon as i say aki they're like i eat aki my mom makes me aki for yeah. breakfast and i'm like uh, and then they get so excited they just do. to be like oh my gosh my something i eat is is in a book like this is yeah. amazing right and it's like something cultural not like you know something they eat every day it's kind of like you know this is my culture's food you know what i mean like exactly. my culture's food is in a book say what now so they yeah. do get really excited and i noticed the grown-ups in the room who might share the heritage the teachers or the assistants if they also have a caribbean or jamaican background i see them brighten up too they that's right excited. Yep. <laughs> so something that I think we all needed to see as a yeah. kid. Um, yes, I agree. I thank you so much for that great question. I think this is probably a good time for me to show you a little bit about the cake. Yes, um, please. Probably just cool enough. I'm going to bring my camera over. So please excuse me. Um, I just moved recently. So I, <laughs> so I haven't quite uh, set up everything exactly yet. But I, I'm going to set this up on my stove. And if there are any other questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, we would be more than happy to answer your questions. Yeah. But thank you, Cabrina, for that, that really wonderful question, because that's a really good one. All right. So I'm going to just show a little bit about the kind of ingredients that you'll need for this apple guava cake. So we have all-purpose flour, and we also have... Um, I actually veganized the cake. So this cake was, uh, the recipe required three eggs. So what I did is, um, I am a vegetarian. I don't have eggs in my house. So I actually, but I can make the alternatives. So the alternatives to make eggs, you, you actually use water and flax meal or flax seeds, ground flax seeds, or you can use applesauce or you can use a banana. I use actually both of these. Okay. And that just helped me to create um, the consistency to make the eggs, like the egg sticking kind of consistency um this is the guava jam that you're going to need uh and any brand of guava jam will do and of course it got lots of apples these are honey crisp apples they grow in ontario which is where we live in, in canada um and usually i use a granny smith to cook uh, but i had uh, these um honey crisps and i also needed some baking powder 
this lid is starting to come off so i don't want any accidents <laughs> here so just pardon me there we go cool. and i needed some sugar some cinnamon some vanilla yes. cinnamon with apple always delicious yeah <laughs> so so i took lots of pictures i will be sharing the pictures on my social media um, and one of the cool things about this cake is you have to prepare each section separately. So the app, oh, I better turn that oven off because it's so hot. I could feel the heat. Um, so you do need to take the apples, you cut them up into uh, pieces, and then you uh, combine it with the jam. And then you would actually take the flour and make like a dry mix of the dry ingredients and then a wet mix with the wet ingredients oh, okay. and combine those. And basically what you're creating is almost like a little layer cake. You create a, a layer of the cake, just the batter, put the layer of the fruit with the apples and the jam, and then you put the rest of the cake on top. Oh, so so okay. I think, yeah, nice. I baked this in a spring form pan. So, uh, sorry, I am <laughs> a little awkward here. So a spring form pan is a special type of pan. I'll just show it to you. And I had to grease the pan first. And the cool thing about a spring form pan is that you have to take off the, maybe I'll just turn this camera around. It's, it's like a little, um, this thing is like a cylinder and you can actually remove it. Mm -hmm. It's called a spring form. Yeah. It has a little gadget at the side. So what you can do is you're going to open this gadget out. And I had um, put it in a pan. So the spring form pan inside of a baking sheet because I, I thought there would be some leakage. There was a little bit of leakage. And now I open the spring form pan and all I do is I just lift this part up. And, uh oh. <laughs> oh yes, my grandma has one of those. There we go. Uh -huh. yeah. And now you can see the cake. Oh, nice. Yeah, so it's a flat cake. Um, I had my, I think my spring four pan was a little big, but if you want uh, a more narrow cake, you could get a nine inch. Uh, can you cut it can so cut you can it? see inside? And, or you can get a seven by 12, seven by 11 rectangular pan. Okay. Can you oh. cut it so we can see inside? Sure. All right. Oh, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> uh Shada, you're asking me a lot. No, I'm just <laughs> all right. Just give me one moment. I'm gonna get my knife. I'm gonna cut it. I'm gonna show you what it looks cool. like. And I'm going to um just need a moment here. And maybe while I do get ready, Shade can take a few questions from the audience. Yes. <laughs> if there's any questions, please put them in the chat. That'd be great. Oh, Anybody has any questions while Nadia gets her cake all cut up? We love honey crisp apples. Yes. Oh yes, I go to Chudley's every year and we go apple picking and that's like one of our favorite things to do in the fall. <laughs> all right. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. So we have a question. I love the art in your books. How was the process of making sure the art was reflective of Jamaican culture? Oh, thank you so much for that. Um, you know what? Uh, so Sayada uh, Ramdial, the illustrator for the for Julian the Mango Tree, she's from Trinidad, so she has a Caribbean background. Um, you know, it, it is pretty similar. Um, you know, similar looking. Um, so she kind of already had a you know general idea of what the Caribbean looks like. So. Um, she was she basically uh you know she looked at places you know looked on you know google of course you know what jamaica looks like she's like oh my gosh this looks very much like trinidad so she didn't have too hard of a time you know making the um you know drawing the illustrations uh to look like jamaica so uh it came pretty pretty easy to her in that sense um but yeah it was the process, she basically, you know, just looked up what Jamaica looks like, compared it with Trinidad and kind of, you know, went off of that. So um, that's pretty much how she did it. That's a really great question, though. Thank you. Very. And, and here we have I, the apple. And I just remember, cake. sorry, I remembered something that uh, your illustrator said. She, her dad has a mango tree, or there's a mango tree in her backyard. So I think she had that as a sample. Um, and just to answer the question that from too. my side, um, Rosa Nazari, 
did the illustrations and uh so usually what happens you can see the draft of the illustrations before they've been colored uh or colorized so i saw the uh draft of the illustrations for my book and uh, i got to give some feedback and i also shared it with the contributors because we have 21 plus one extra person who gave recipes and stories so they were also able to give some insight to their own cultures because there were um you know, if, if there, for example, there's something that was shown in the illustration that we don't have that, or it's a little bit different for us. And Rosa was um, res very responsive. The team was very responsive because we want to make sure that people feel represented well and that they are not, um, they want, we wanted everyone to be happy with the illustrations. So I, I really do appreciate um, the publisher that I worked with for making that effort and making, allowing for that as well. For sure. Thank you. Kayla Classroom says, my daughter wants to know if you like mangoes like Julie. I <laughs> certainly do. Mm -hmm. I love mm -hmm. mangoes. Um, I Every time I go to the grocery store, I buy mangoes. Um, I just, I, I love them. I like everything mango, mango juice, mango, just mangoes in general, mango salad, uh, mango smoothies. <laughs> so I love oh, everything mango. So yes, I do. That's a really great question. Mangoes are they delicious. Are. I yeah. know the only person I, that I know that doesn't like mangoes are is my son. He doesn't my youngest son doesn't like mangoes. Uh, and I'm like, how are you my kid? Uh, what? <laughs> oh, yeah. But everyone else I know loves mangoes. All yes, right. Well, All right. And so we have the apple guava cake there. That's right. Get a little close up. Yeah. And this is nice. like a, so this is an, a, mm -hmm. a, a this is a Cuban American dish. So the Cuban side is the guava cake, and the the American side are the apple. So um, Ruth Bahar combined the two. And one thing, as I was preparing this dish, just as I was cutting it up, I realized, you know what? I actually have some roots in Cuba via my great grandmother because there are a number there are actually a number of Jamaicans who went to Cuba to work in the 1920s. Some of them stayed. So they're actually if you go there, there are people who actually have Jamaican uh English or Jamaican sounding last names. And uh there's a connection there. And of course Ooh. um we both have Jamaican backgrounds. So guava is a, a fruit that is eaten also in Jamaica. Right. So um but yeah just you can see there's like a bit of a it looks like a crust that and those little brown things if you see the specks that's actually the flaxseed that I, mm -hmm. I tossed in there to add a bit of um to make it like the eggs because i am um veganized the recipe a little bit uh but yeah <clears throat> this has been great i'm gonna just yeah. sample a little bit just to tell you mm -hmm. awesome mm -hmm. nice very tasty <laughs> i know i need to i'm gonna start uh what i need to make some of those recipes i especially want to try those nigerian puff puff um very good little, like, yeah those are really good they were delicious at your book launch and i want to make some at home so i will be trying out pretty much everything in that cookbook <laughs> but i think i'm gonna start there i think that's <laughs> All right, a so great idea yeah so if anybody has any other questions um you feel free to put them in the chat or of course you could shoot us you know a dm um but if not Thank you so much for tuning into Cooking Book Harvest Edition. Um, this was, uh, I, we greatly appreciate you guys tuning in. So thank you so much. And thank you for all joining us. Uh, please go out and purchase the books. We are so excited to share it with right. you and uh, enjoy your foods and share them and share with, and also talk about the tough stuff because we need to have those conversations. But we wish you all a great night. For sure. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. <laughs>